Chapter 45 The Foreshadowing of the Cross This chapter is based on portions taken from Matthew chapter 16, Mark chapter 8, and Luke chapter 9. The work of Christ on earth was hastening to a close. Before him in vivid outline lay the scenes whither his feet were tending. Even before he took humanity upon him, he saw the whole length of the path he must travel in order to save that which was lost. Every pang that rent his heart, every insult that was heaped upon his head, every privation that he was called to endure, was open to his view before he laid aside his crown and royal robe and stepped down from the throne to clothe his divinity with humanity. The path from the manger to Calvary was all before his eyes. He knew the anguish that would come upon him. He knew it all, and yet he said, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Ever before him he saw the result of his mission. His earthly life, so full of toil and self-sacrifice, was cheered by the prospect that he would not have all this travail for naught. By giving his life for the life of men, he would win back the world to its loyalty to God. Although the baptism of blood must first be received, although the sins of the world were to weigh upon his innocent soul, although the shadow of an unspeakable woe was upon him, yet for the joy that was set before him, he chose to endure the cross and despised the shame. From the chosen companions of his ministry, the scenes that lay before him were as yet hidden, but the time was near when they must behold his agony. They must see him whom they had loved and trusted, delivered into the hands of his enemies, and hung upon the cross of Calvary. Soon he must leave them to face the world without the comfort of his visible presence. He knew how bitter hate and unbelief would persecute them, and he desired to prepare them for their trials. Jesus and his disciples had now come into one of the towns about Caesarea Philippi. They were beyond the limits of Galilee in a region where idolatry prevailed. Here the disciples were withdrawn from the controlling influence of Judaism and brought into closer contact with the heathen worship. Around them were represented forms of superstition that existed in all parts of the world. Jesus desired that a view of these things might lead them to feel their responsibility to the heathen. During his stay in this region, he endeavored to withdraw from teaching the people and to devote himself more fully to his disciples. He was about to tell them of the suffering that awaited him, but first he went away alone and prayed that their hearts might be prepared to receive his words. Upon joining them, he did not at once communicate that which he desired to impart. Before doing this, he gave them an opportunity of confessing their faith in him that they might be strengthened for the coming trial. He asked, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Sadly, the disciples were forced to acknowledge that Israel had failed to recognize their Messiah. Some, indeed, when they saw his miracles, had declared him to be the son of David. The multitudes that had been fed at Bethsaida had desired to proclaim him king of Israel. Many were ready to accept him as a prophet, but they did not believe him to be the Messiah. Jesus now put a second question relating to the disciples themselves. But whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. From the first, Peter had believed Jesus to be the Messiah. Many others who had been convicted by the preaching of John the Baptist and had accepted Christ began to doubt as to John's mission when he was imprisoned and put to death, and they now doubted that Jesus was the Messiah for whom they had looked so long. Many of the disciples who had ardently expected Jesus to take his place on David's throne left him 
when they perceived that he had no such intention. But Peter and his companions turned not from their allegiance. The vacillating course of those who praised yesterday and condemned today did not destroy the faith of the true follower of the Savior. Peter declared, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He waited not for kingly honors to crown his Lord, but accepted him in his humiliation. Peter had expressed the faith of the twelve, yet the disciples were still far from understanding Christ's mission. The opposition and misrepresentation of the priests and rulers, while it could not turn them away from Christ, still caused them great perplexity. They did not see their way clearly. The influence of their early training, the teaching of the rabbis, the power of tradition, still intercepted their view of truth. From time to time, precious rays of light from Jesus shone upon them. Yet often, they were like men groping among shadows. But on this day, before they were brought face to face with the great trial of their faith, the Holy Spirit rested upon them in power. For a little time their eyes were turned away from the things which are seen, to behold the things which are not seen. Beneath the guise of humanity, they discerned the glory of the Son of God. Jesus answered Peter, saying, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The truth which Peter had confessed is the foundation of the believer's faith. It is that which Christ himself has declared to be eternal life. But the possession of this knowledge was no ground for self-glorification. Through no wisdom or goodness of his own had it been revealed to Peter. Never can humanity of itself attain to a knowledge of the divine. It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Only the spirit of adoption can reveal to us the deep things of God which eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and the fact that Peter discerned the glory of Christ was an evidence that he had been taught of God. Ah, indeed, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. Jesus continued, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word Peter signifies a stone, a rolling stone. Peter was not the rock upon which the church was founded, the gates of hell did prevail against him when he denied his Lord with cursing and swearing. The church was built upon one against whom the gates of hell could not prevail. Centuries before the Savior's advent, Moses had pointed to the rock of Israel's salvation. The psalmist had sung of the rock of my strength. Isaiah had written, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Peter himself, writing by inspiration, applies this prophecy to Jesus. He says, If you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, unto whom coming a living stone, rejected indeed of men, but with God elect, precious, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, said Jesus, I will build my church. In the presence of God and all the heavenly intelligences, in the presence of the unseen army of hell, Christ founded his church upon the living rock. That rock is himself, his own body, for us broken and bruised, Against the church built upon this foundation, the gates of hell shall not prevail. 
how feeble the church appeared when Christ spoke these words. There was only a handful of believers against whom all the power of demons and evil men would be directed, yet the followers of Christ were not to fear. Built upon the rock of their strength, they could not be overthrown. For six thousand years, faith has builded upon Christ. For six thousand years, the floods and tempests of satanic wrath have beaten upon the rock of our salvation, but it stands unmoved. Peter had expressed the truth which is the foundation of the church's faith, and Jesus now honored him as the representative of the whole body of believers. He said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are the words of Christ. All the words of Holy Scripture are His, and are here included. These words have power to open and to shut heaven. They declare the conditions upon which men are received or rejected. Thus the work of those who preach God's word is a savor of life unto life or of death unto death. Theirs is a mission weighted with eternal results. The Savior did not commit the work of the gospel to Peter individually. At a later time, repeating the words that were spoken to Peter, he applied them directly to the church. And the same in substance was spoken also to the twelve as representatives of the body of believers. If Jesus had delegated any special authority to one of the disciples above the others, we should not find them so often contending as to who should be the greatest. They would have submitted to the wish of their master and honored the one whom he had chosen. Instead of appointing one to be their head, Christ said to the disciples, Be not ye called rabbi, neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. The head of every man is Christ. God, who put all things under the Savior's feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is built upon Christ as its foundation. It is to obey Christ as its head. It is not to depend upon man or be controlled by man. Many claim that a position of trust in the church gives them authority to dictate what other men shall believe and what they shall do. This claim God does not sanction. The Savior declares, All ye are brethren. All are exposed to temptation and are liable to error. Upon no finite being can we depend for guidance. The rock of faith is the living presence of Christ in the church. Upon this the weakest may depend, and those who think themselves the strongest will prove to be the weakest unless they make Christ their efficiency. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm. The Lord is the rock, his work is perfect. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. After Peter's confession, Jesus charged the disciples to tell no man that he was the Christ. This charge was given because of the determined opposition of the scribes and Pharisees. More than this, the people and even the disciples had so false a conception of the Messiah that a public announcement of him would give them no true idea of his character or his work. But day by day he was revealing himself to them as the Savior, and thus he desired to give them a true conception of him as the Messiah. The disciples still expected Christ to reign as a temporal prince. Although he had so long concealed his design, they believed that he would not always remain in poverty and obscurity. The time was near when he would establish his kingdom. That the hatred of the priests and rabbis would never be overcome, that Christ would be rejected by his own nation, condemned as a deceiver, and crucified as a malefactor, such a thought the disciples had never entertained. But the hour of the power of darkness was drawing on, and Jesus must open to his disciples 
the conflict before them. He was sad as he anticipated the trial. Hitherto he had refrained from making known to them anything relative to his sufferings and death. In his conversation with Nicodemus, he had said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But the disciples did not hear this, and had they heard, would not have understood. But now they have been with Jesus, listening to his words, beholding his works, until, notwithstanding the humility of his surroundings and the opposition of priests and people, they can join in the testimony of Peter, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now the time has come for the veil that hides the future to be withdrawn. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Speechless with grief and amazement, the disciples listened. Christ had accepted Peter's acknowledgment of him as the Son of God, and now his words pointing to his suffering and death seemed incomprehensible. Peter could not keep silent. He laid hold upon his master as if to draw him back from his impending doom, exclaiming, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Peter loved his Lord, but Jesus did not commend him for thus manifesting the desire to shield him from suffering. Peter's words were not such as would be a help and solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. They were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace toward a lost world, nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by his own example. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. The impression which his words would make was directly opposed to that which Christ desired to make on the minds of his followers, and the Savior was moved to utter one of the sternest rebukes that ever fell from his lips. Get thee behind me, Satan! Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Satan was trying to discourage Jesus and turn him from his mission, and Peter, in his blind love, was giving voice to the temptation. The prince of evil was the author of the thought. His instigation was behind that impulsive appeal. In the wilderness, Satan had offered Christ the dominion of the world on condition of forsaking the path of humiliation and sacrifice. Now he was presenting the same temptation to the disciple of Christ. He was seeking to fix Peter's gaze upon the earthly glory, that he might not behold the cross to which Jesus desired to turn his eyes. And through Peter, Satan was again pressing the temptation upon Jesus. But the Savior heeded it not. His thought was for his disciple. Satan had interposed between Peter and his master that the heart of the disciple might not be touched at the vision of Christ's humiliation for him. The words of Christ were spoken not to Peter, but to the one who was trying to separate him from his Redeemer. Get thee behind me, Satan. No longer interpose between me and my erring servant. Let me come face to face with Peter, that I may reveal to him the mystery of my love. It was to Peter a bitter lesson, and one which he learned but slowly, that the path of Christ on earth lay through agony and humiliation. The disciple shrank from fellowship with his Lord in suffering, but in the heat of the furnace fire he was to learn its blessing. Long afterward, when his active form was bowed with the burden of years and labors, he wrote, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. 
Jesus now explained to his disciples that his own life of self-abnegation was an example of what theirs should be. Calling about him with the disciples, the people who had been lingering near, he said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. The cross was associated with the power of Rome. It was the instrument of the most cruel and humiliating form of death. The lowest criminals were required to bear the cross to the place of execution, and often, as it was about to be laid upon their shoulders, they resisted with desperate violence until they were overpowered and the instrument of torture was bound upon them. But Jesus bade his followers take up the cross and bear it after him. To the disciples his words, though dimly comprehended, pointed to their submission to the most bitter humiliation, submission even unto death for the sake of Christ. No more complete self-surrender could the Savior's words have pictured. But all this he had accepted for them. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult, and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor, that through his poverty we might be rich. We are to follow in the path he trod. Love for souls for whom Christ died means crucifixion of self. He who is a child of God should henceforth look upon himself as a link in the chain let down to save the world, one with Christ in his plan of mercy, going forth with him to seek and save the lost. The Christian is ever to realize that he has consecrated himself to God, and that in character he is to reveal Christ to the world. The self-sacrifice, the sympathy, the love manifested in the life of Christ are to reappear in the life of the worker for God. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Selfishness is death. No organ of the body could live should it confine its service to itself. The heart, failing to send its lifeblood to the hand and the head, would quickly lose its power. As our lifeblood, so is the love of Christ diffused through every part of his mystical body. We are members of one another, and the soul that refuses to impart will perish. And what is a man profited, said Jesus, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Beyond the poverty and humiliation of the present, he pointed the disciples to his coming in glory, not in the splendor of an earthly throne, but with the glory of God and the hosts of heaven. And then, he said, he shall reward every man according to his works. Then for their encouragement he gave the promise, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. But the disciples did not comprehend his words. The glory seemed far away. Their eyes were fixed upon the nearer view, the earthly life of poverty, humiliation, and suffering. Must their glowing expectations of the Messiah's kingdom be relinquished? Were they not to see their Lord exalted to the throne of David? Could it be that Christ was to live a humble, homeless wanderer, to be despised, rejected, and put to death? Sadness oppressed their hearts, for they loved their master. Doubt also harassed their minds, for it seemed incomprehensible that the Son of God should be subjected to such cruel humiliation. They questioned why he should voluntarily go to Jerusalem to meet the treatment which he had told them he was there to receive. How could he resign himself to such a fate and leave them in greater darkness than that in which they were groping before he revealed himself to them. In the region of Caesarea Philippi, Christ was out of the reach of Herod and Caiaphas, the disciples reasoned. He had nothing to fear from the hatred of the Jews or from the power of the Romans. Why not work there, 
at a distance from the Pharisees. Why need he give himself up to death? If he was to die, how was it that his kingdom was to be established so firmly that the gates of hell should not prevail against it? To the disciples this was indeed a mystery. They were even now journeying along the shores of the Sea of Galilee toward the city where all their hopes were to be crushed. They dared not remonstrate with Christ, but they talked together in low, sorrowful tones in regard to what the future would be. Even amid their questionings, they clung to the thought that some unforeseen circumstance might avert the doom which seemed to await their Lord. Thus they sorrowed and doubted, hoped and feared, for six long, gloomy days.' 